Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. Yeah. Thank you all for coming tonight. Welcome to the talk, um, Gaia and Us by Dr. Stefan Harding. Um, we encourage you to have, if possible, and if you feel comfortable, to have your camera on for the start and also for the end when we'll have the Q&A sessions, the questions and answers. And we encourage that just because it gives us a more of a feeling of being here together um, as people behind the screen uh, coming to learn and to share this moment, this experience, this learning experience together. Uh, my name is uh, Juliana. I am Brazilian. But I'm speaking with you tonight from Hong Kong. And I am a collaborator of the of Kaduri Farm and particularly of Kaduri Earth Program, uh, of which this talk uh, tonight is part. We are very glad to be with Stefan again to welcome him again. It's the um, fourth, I think, fourth time that we are running uh, the course called "Deepening Our Connection to Nature: A Journey into Gaia and Deep Ecology." This course will start in June, is a two week online course. And tonight's uh, talk is both an opportunity for, for us, for Stefan to share more, for people to, who are interested in the course to get to know um, of what we will be learning together, also to get to know Stefan. But it's also an opportunity for those who may not have the, the time or the possibility to join the course um, to, to also learn uh, from what we will be exploring in the course in a, in a sample version um, of what we will be learning. So um, also to, to share a little bit about Stefan, I'm sure you've heard, you've uh, read in the description, but Stefan is one of the founding members of Schumacher College, an international center for transformative education and education for sustainable living that is based in the UK, in Devon and has been inspiring many other places and people around the world. And the Kaduri Earth Program um, is very inspired by the work at Schumacher and of teachers like Stefan. And Stefan has been teaching alongside key thinkers in the ecological movement. Uh, for example, uh, Annie Ness, the proponent of deep ecology, will be learning, hearing more of deep ecology from Stefan in the course. And also um, he has taught together with James Lovelock, the proponent of Gaia theory, also um, will be learning from Stefan about Gaia theory tonight. Um, Stefan also founded and coordinated a master's in Schumacher College in holistic science. I had the pleasure and the delight of being a student uh, 12, 12 years ago uh, with Stefan and being very inspired by his teaching and his passionate, uh, his passion with nature, his passionate teaching, his music, and also his uh, unique gift 
of bringing science together, reviving science in a way together through myth and stories and this is, we'll get a taste of this tonight. So thank you all for coming. And just before I pass the word to Stefan, very few practical reminders that um, uh, this talk, as you may have seen, is being recorded and it will be shared later on uh, social platform, the social media platforms of Kaduri Farm um, in order so we can help spread the con this content and the inspiration. Um, in terms of the flow of tonight's session, Stefan will speak uh, for around 35 minutes, more or less, and then we'll have time for questions and answers. I do ask that during the talk, if you have questions that are coming to you, if you can take note of them for yourself, and then when the Q&A starts, I will invite you to type your question in the chat, and then um, I will be bringing those questions to Stefan. Um, I think this is it. We also, if you have any technical problem, we also, uh, you can write in the chat to Holly or Natalie, you will see KFBG next to their names uh, and you can uh, type a message to them and they will help you. And yes, without uh, any more, I'll pass to you, Stefan, and I hope you all enjoy the talk. Ah, thank you, Juliana. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for for being here this evening how nice that so many people are here okay so um without any further ado i'll show you my share my screen with you here we are so this is what we are concerned with you know the state of our planet the fate of our planet the ecological crisis um we're at a you probably know we're at a very dangerous point now where if we don't start taking action seriously and in a widespread global way, we're not going to avoid very serious consequences of climate change and biodiversity loss. So that's why we're doing this course and this talk. Um, Gaia and us, that's me. Uh, we've got to come to terms with our global situation and what we've done to the planet. And it's very important to understand why we've reached this point in our relationship with our Earth. And that's why we're doing this talk tonight. So I'm going to use a mixture of science and uh, mythology and also some Taoism towards the end, which is from your own amazing ancient Chinese culture. But let's start with Gaia. Um, well, Gaia has two dimensions, I would say. It's got a mythological dimension, which is the deepest dimension. Um, and it's got a more superficial, yet incredibly important dimension, modern dimension, which is a scientific dimension to Gaia. So we're going to look at both of those. But first of all, let's start with the mythological. Um, so myth of Gaia. So the word Gaia um, in Western culture comes from the ancient Greeks. Um, and their myth of Gaia was like this. I mean, it's a very ancient myth. They had this idea that the universe is a kind of great intelligence. And before any time, space, or matter existed, it felt lonely, this great intelligence. I mean, in Taoism, we might think of it as the Tao, possibly. I'm not sure. It's very hard to define the Tao, of course. And it felt lonely. It wanted to become something. It wanted to know itself. And so it invented time, space, and matter. And the first being that emerged from this primordial chaos or maybe the Tao, according to the ancient Greek myth, was the earth, Gaia. They called her Gaia, the firstborn. You see, here's Hesiod writing about this 700 BC, but it's actually a much older myth. It's a very ancient myth. Chaos was first of all. That's the great intelligence I mentioned. But next appeared broad-breasted Gaia, the sure standing place for all. So for the ancient Greeks, here's more Hesiod, the earth, Gaia, was the firstborn, very sacred being, you know, the firstborn of this vast intelligence. And then she gave birth to the stars, um, and then uh, the stars and the rest of the cosmos. And then they mated, earth, Gaia, and her, her son, the cosmos, mated. And out of that union came all the living beings, the gods and goddesses, and all the living beings, plants, animals, etc., including humans. I mean, that's a very deep myth, you know, it means that the whole earth 
and indeed the whole cosmos are full of a kind of sacred intelligence. You know, they're, they're sacred. They're, they're full of wisdom, full of knowledge. They're alive. They're sentient. Mm. They have soul. There's a vast intelligence in the earth, a vast intelligence in the cosmos. And later on in, in the uh, Latin times, the Roman times and beyond, this, this sensitivity was called the anima mundi, which means in Latin, the soul, anima is soul, mundi of the world, the soul of the world. So the idea is that the whole cosmos has a soul, an intelligence. Um, and we can picture that with this kind of spiral. See, here's the origin of everything, and it it's, develops through time and space. And the anima mundi develops through time and space. The whole universe is trying to realize itself. And all the traditional cultures of the world including Chinese, traditional Chinese culture, which is very, very sophisticated. I'm a great admirer of traditional Chinese culture. They, all these cultures knew, it was obvious to them all, that the earth was alive, that the earth had a soul, that the cosmos was a soul, that was a deep meaning in reality. Even in England here, we still have some remnants of this worldview. This is a famous sacred oak tree in England, and people come to this tree to to be in the presence of this vast intelligence uh, represented by this tree. Shakespeare spoke about it, you know, a famous playwright. He said um, in one of his plays, he has a character saying, there are sermons in stones, tongues in trees, and books in the running brooks. I've got the order wrong, I think, but that's the basic idea, you know, that the, every pit of nature speaks, can speak to us because it's all full of this vast intelligence. And of course, in your own culture, in Chinese culture, you have your Kuan Yin. Um, that is a Gaia figure, as far as I'm concerned, from, from Eastern culture, because Gaia is something that all humanity shares, the feeling of the Mother Earth, of the living Earth, intelligent, sacred universe, intelligent, sacred Earth. This is the Kuan Yin, I think, in Kaduri, isn't it, at the top of the mountain in Kaduri Farm. So it's the same idea you see manifesting in your own culture as well as in our culture. And here is a goddess or a Gaia figure from 5,000 um, or more, 5,000 or more BC. So very ancient in our own culture from Crete. You see this ancient figure of Gaia, look at her, you know, a really um, fertile, solid feminine figure representing the, the earth and the sacredness of the earth. Now, what happened in Western culture, which has now given rise to modernity, is that this ancient mythological understanding of a sacred cosmos disappeared and was replaced by a more scientific understanding, which we'll come to in a minute, in which the universe and Gaia are not sacred at all. In fact, there's no sacredness anywhere anymore in the, in the view of modernity. So let's see what happened. And it's a complicated story. How on earth did we shift from, um, you know, a goddess culture full of respect for, the, for Mother Earth and for the cosmos as sentient beings into, an, into a situation where nothing is sacred, where we humans can take out minerals, destroy forests as much as we want because nothing is sacred. And we're only here for our own benefit. Human beings are only here for our own benefit. We better make ourselves comfortable during our brief lifetimes before we die. And when we die, that's it. If we know we now, modern, us moderns living in a completely meaningless universe and in a completely meaningless planet. So how come this tremendous shift has happened? How can we understand it and how can we do something about it? Well, let's look into that. The story is complex, but it looks like round about um, 5,000, 6,000 years ago, there were a group of people around the Black Sea, you can see here, called the Yamnaya, um, who developed um, a sky god culture. They believed that their, their divinity was not a feminine mother god goddess at all, but rather this distant warrior, aggressive sky god lived in the sky, was a man and was a warrior, was, loved war. And these people had horses and they developed very sophisticated weapons for those days, you know, bows and arrows, etc. And they were nomadic and so they were quite used to moving vast distances. And so you can see here, they moved to the West. In the West, 
and this sort of area of Europe, um, in the Neolithic, around about that time, the, the prin principal culture was an earth goddess culture, as I showed you. Um, we have lots of those, these kinds of statues everywhere. There's no evidence of weapons or war. They were agriculturalists, but they, were, they seemed to have been very much in tune with nature, with Gaia, and they worshipped the Mother Earth. They were a Mother, mother Earth culture. And, these, and they had very few weapons, as I said, whereas these um, aggressive sky god people from um, further east swept over Western Europe all the way up to Britain, and they basically massacred um, the sky god, uh, sorry, the mother goddess cultures and wiped them out. There's even genetic evidence for this. Um, so we're pretty sure something like this happened. And this sky god culture then established itself within um, the Western mindset. I would say the Western culture then shifted from a mother goddess culture, respecting nature, to a sky god culture, in which uh, the sky god commanded us to dominate nature, subjugate nature for the sake of human beings, from welfare of human beings. Here's a, here's a sky god from later, much later on. You can see he's got an axe. Can you see that axe? His lightning, he's pretty aggressive. This sky god is actually a mixture of mother goddess culture and sky god culture. So it's, it's a complicated story. And there was a mixture. The ancient Greeks later on had a mixture of sky god and mother goddess. So it's complicated. But anyway, you can see here's basically a sky god figure. And this sky god attitude went through Western culture all the way through to the scientific revolution. And I like to think that during the scientific revolution, mm. the sky god really became absolutely dominant. And here we have Descartes, the great um, mathematical genius, saying during the beginning of the scientific revolution, in the 17th century, the whole earth and the whole universe are nothing more than machines. That's a real sky god statement. He's saying there is no soul, there is no intelligence in nature, in the earth and the universe. They're just dead machines and we can use them as we like. And what's more, if we use what we now call the scientific method, if we reduce nature to her component parts, and if we understand how those parts relate to each other using measurement and mathematics, then we can get absolute control over nature, which is what we need. For Descartes, humans still had souls. The only, only, only entities that had souls were humans. And the human soul was connected to the sky god, who was a mathematician sky god. But only people had souls. Animals didn't have souls. So when his followers cut open live dogs and the dogs screamed in pain, he said, ignore the screams. They're just the creakings of the machine. That's the sky god culture. And now the sky god culture since then has gone through into our, our times and is wreaking absolute havoc on the planet. So it's really essential that we rediscover Gaia. And what has the sky god culture done to our planet? Well, this. This is the trajectory of carbon dioxide um, in our atmosphere that's gone up and up and up um, since the Industrial Revolution, entirely because of our burning of fossil fuels and destruction of biodiversity. And this is now getting very, very dangerous, as I mentioned. Um, you can read the latest IPCC summary report. You should try and read that if you can. And they're saying that many thousands of scientists around the world are saying, now's our last chance to take hold of this situation before we pass the 1.5 degree centigrade guide rail. After that, all kinds of mayhem, climate mayhem, are going to be unleashed, which is basically going to destroy modernity. It's very serious times we're living in now because of this sky god culture. More, more data showing you what the sky god has done to our planet. This is just the heating over... Um, the last th couple of thousand years, you know, with the massive heating, we're around here now, warming of our massive warming of our planet, and this is just an illustration of it. I hope this works. There we go. You can just see this is the 1.5 degrees guide rail that we're supposed to be stick. With, that we're supposed to stay within if we're going to avoid really serious consequences of climate change. These are the temperature that are going up in different months in different years, and you can see that. Even in 2016, we were so close to the guide rail that it was, it looks almost impossible that we could do that. Just look at that again. 
it seems almost impossible that we could avoid crossing over the 1.5 degrees threshold. But the latest IPCC report says that we have a chance if we all act as a concerted humanity right now. It doesn't look very likely to me. And we're going to have more wildfires, etc. We're going to lose our biodiversity. Now, something more personal. I, I became acutely aware of, of the anima mundi and the soul of the world when I was at Oxford doing my doctorate, my PhD, which I did on in this beautiful wood near Oxford called Rushbids Wood. And I was working on a Chinese deer for my doctorate called a barking deer or muntjac deer, um, which you have in China, it comes from southwestern China. I think you may have some at Kaduri, I'm not sure, in Hong Kong. Yeah, you have them. Lucky you. Look how beautiful they are. Look, I just fell in love with them, you know, and I did my doctorate on them. Look how beautiful. They cause a lot of problems in England. They shouldn't really be here, but I adore them anyway. Um, and during that work, I spent many hours in my wood, in Rushbed's wood, and I had a feeling that the wood had a soul, you know, the wood had a sort of meaning beyond my scientific understanding of the wood. And then I came to Schumacher College, and there I met James Lovelock. Um, and James Lovelock was one of my teachers and dear friends who died last year at the age of 103. He was the one who received um, the insight of Gaia, not as a poet or as a philosopher, but as a scientist. And round about 1960, when he received this insight that the Earth is not a dead machine, but that the Earth is a living, great living organism, um, the situation in the planet was already getting very serious, and modernity was already destroying so much of the planet and warming up the climate. Mm. That I think Gaia needed a spokesperson to tell this scientific culture that the Earth is not dead, that the Earth is a, is a, a living being, and that we'd better stop destroying her. And I like to think that one day Gaia popped up in his garden, see, like this, and sort of looked into his soul and decided he was the one who could speak about Gaia scientifically to modernity, which is, after all, a totally scientific culture. And so he created what I like to call the science of Gaia, as opposed to the myth of Gaia, or rather to complement the myth of Gaia. And just a little bit about that. We'll be, we'll be exploring this much more deeply in the course, so I hope you can join us on the course. But here's the basic idea. Here's the solar system. And we, the, blue, the, the blue orbit is, is the Earth. Um, that's the orbit of the Earth. This is Venus, Mars, and here's the Earth. And in the 1960s, when Lovelock had the idea of a living Earth, as I mentioned, um, mainstream science didn't think of the Earth as alive. They thought of the Earth as a dead ball of rock with a thin smear of life on the surface. And the living beings are called the biota. So here they are. There's the biota. And then we also have the rocks, the atmosphere, and the, and the water of the planet. And the idea before Gaia, the pre-Gaia idea in science, was that, as I say, that the Earth was a dead ball of rock. Here's the rocks. With some atmosphere and water and with a very thin smear of life on the surface, that couldn't possibly have any influence on the rocks, what the atmosphere was like, and whether there was water. And in fact, the rocks were considered to be in charge of the planet. Because in the rock department, we have volcanoes. Volcanoes emit carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas, to the atmosphere. That sets the temperature of the Earth. And the biota just have to adapt to that temperature set for them by the rocks, or they go extinct. You see, they have no influence on the rocks, the atmosphere, and the water. It's a dead Earth planet. The rocks are in charge. The biota are completely powerless passengers on the surface of the, ro of the rocky earth. And Lovelock, I haven't got time to tell you the story. If you, if you join us on the course, you'll hear the amazing story of how Jim Lovelock got the idea of Gaia, was given the idea of Gaia when he was working for NASA. But the idea that he came up with, that he was given, is this. Same four components, the biota, all the living beings, that is, the rocks and the atmosphere and the water. But now Lovelock proposes that the biota, the living beings, have huge impacts on the rocks and on the atmosphere on the, and on the water. Um, for example, without life, we wouldn't have 20% oxygen in our atmosphere. That's entirely due to life, you know, to the photosynthesis. 
Without life, we probably wouldn't have granite rocks which form the continents. And without life, the water would have left our planet long ago. So, life, says Lovelock, has huge impacts on the rocks, the atmosphere and the water. And then once these have been conditioned by life, they feed back to determine which of the living beings can live in the very conditions they created for themselves. So you see these four components, biota, rocks, atmosphere and water, in Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis and Gaia theory, are tightly coupled together through feedbacks, which we can understand to some extent scientifically. And Lovelock then makes a further proposal. He says that when we get this tight coupling between biota, rocks, atmosphere and water, we get what we call in science an emergent property. That's to say something arising at the level of the whole that we can't understand from studying the parts in isolation. And what that, that emergent property that emerges from the Earth as a whole because of these interactions is the ability of the whole planet to regulate its surface conditions, such as its temperature and distribution of key elements and acidity, to regulate those key conditions um, within the narrow limits that living beings can tolerate over thousands of millions of years. And you see, this is saying that the Earth is not a dead ball of rock, it's a living organism. Organisms do self-regulation. We're self-regulating so many things right now in our bodies, including our temperatures, hormone levels, etc., because of feedbacks within ourselves and with our environment. And it's the same with the planet, says Lovelock. And he got the name Gaia from his name from his friend William Golding, who suggested the, the name Gaia to him. And I think that's one of the biggest moments in Western culture when the word Gaia comes back into our culture after being banished for 2000 years. So in my view, what's happened is that Gaia herself as a great intelligence gave Lovelock the idea of herself as a self-regulating being. He expressed it scientifically to a scientific culture. And now that we have the word Gaia once more in our culture, we have the chance to reconnect with the Gaia as a living being. And if we don't, our, our modernity, I don't think will survive. This is just to show you the relationship between biota this hand and atmosphere, rocks and water. You see, they're mutually creating each other. You see, so this is Escher, his, his famous drawing called Hands. Now, Lynn Margulis was another great um, biologist who also taught at Schumacher College, and I was, I've been lucky to work with her. And she pointed out that um, biodiversity, particularly the biodiversity of microbes, is extremely important for Gaia's self-regulation. So we'll just have a quick look at the importance of biodiversity. You know, we hear a lot about carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases and how they're disturbing um, the earth and quite rightly too. But we need to know just as much about biodiversity because the biodiversity is very important for regulating our climate. So here's a bit about biodiversity within a Guyan context. This is how many species we think we We've sorry, how many species we've described scientifically. This is a bit out of date now. But basically, 1.5 million species we have in museums, you know, in jars and pinned to boards and things. The real number is probably more like 10 million species. So we have maybe even 30 million species at the out, outermost limit. So we have an incredibly biodiverse planet. And it all all of biological life started off maybe 3,800 million years ago from a group of ancestor cells, very simple cells that then developed into all this amazing biodiversity. And the biodiversity, of course, all the living beings relate to each other ecologically through what we call food chains. So we have, we have at the bottom, we have um, on the land, we have plants, and in the ocean, we have phytoplankton. And then they're eaten by uh, herbivores, grasshoppers, for example, in on land and zooplankton in the ocean. And they're, they're eating by predators, frogs on land, something like a crab in the ocean. And they in turn are eaten by t top predators, hawks on land and sea otters in the ocean. So we have this flow of, of energy. The, the, um, 
the photosynthesizers, of course, are the ones that capture energy from the sun, and that energy gets fed up through the food chains. But biodiversity is not just organized in chains. Are you ready for this? This is amazing. It's organized in webs. Look at this. This is a marine food web. Each little box here tells you the name of a species, salmon, cod, um, capelin, there's different kinds of fish, and here are the phytoplankton down here, and up here are seabirds, and these are the relationships between them, feeding relationships between them. I mean, that's unbelievably complex. Look at that. Unbelievably complex. The whole of Gaia is made up of relationships like this, not just between organisms with each other, but between organisms, life, um, water, atmosphere, and rocks. Um, here's another food web, terrestrial food web, so you can see it more clearly. Um, but involving seed birds as well, though. So these are feeding relationships. See how complex it, this all is. Now, what we found in science, I was involved with doing this kind of science, is that the more biodiversity there is, in this case, we're looking at a grassland in America. See, we have plant species richness. So the plant, we have more species of plants in our experimental plots. And uh, the more plant species richness, the more plant different kinds of species we have in our grassland, the better drought resistance. Can you see up to a limit beyond, say, 15 species, adding more species of plants doesn't increase drought resistance. But below that, as we add species to our grassland, we get much better drought resistance. And of course, this means that the plants um, and the ecosystem they're part of are absorbing carbon from the atmosphere and holding carbon. So basically, we can say the more species, the more carbon absorption, and therefore the more climate regulation the biodiversity is giving us. And we, a similar experiment was carried out in Europe long ago um, in these different countries with grassland species. And they found that as the number of plant species decreases, um, the hay yield in our grassland goes down in all these different countries. Can you see? including the UK, see it going down. So we decrease the number of species and we get less hay. Hay, of course, holds carbon. It's plant material that holds carbon that was once in the atmosphere. So this is telling us the more species, the more carbon absorption from the atmosphere, the better climate regulation. So it's very foolish of us to destroy forests and destroy biodiversity because we're stopping Gaia from regulating the climate. And furthermore, the same study found that if we have more species in our system, we have better recycling and retention of nutrients, we have better water quality, we have better resistance to weeds and insects and energy cycling. So we have a much healthier ecosystem with biodiversity. But what are we doing to biodiversity? We're destroying it. This is um, a study of how we're losing biodiversity. A bit out of date, 2016 is even worse now. You know, we're, we're starting what we call in science the sixth greatest mass extinction of all life. Entirely due to the sky god and to modernity. So, what can we do about this? Well, I think what we need to do um, is to reunite the science of Gaia and our scientific attitude to nature, which is, of course, a tremendous gift of, of Western culture, to modernity, to the modern world. But on its own, science can be very helpful, but also, as we've seen, it can be and has been immensely destructive. Because in science, and remember, I'm trained as a scientist, meaning is out of the question. You're not allowed to think that the Earth or the universe has any meaning or that it has any soul or any deep purpose or indeed any mystery. So what I'm suggesting, and others like me are suggesting, is that we create what I call a mytho, mytho-scientific attitude. So we reunite the myth with the science, and Gaia is a perfect um, platform on which to do this. So I would say Gaia is mytho-scientific. So let's have a look very briefly at how we might do this. Well, here are the four aspects of Gaia, the, which we mentioned from Lovelock. The biosphere, biota, the rocks, the water, and the atmosphere. And you see they work together in a, in a sort of mandala of wholeness. This is a, a mandala from Jung, the great Swiss psychologist, who we will explore um, in some detail in the course, and particularly in relation to deep ecology, which we're not going to mention very much about today. You see these four aspects, rocks, 
atmosphere, water and biosphere together, they give us what we could say a mandala of self-regulation. You see, this is already a, an image which speaks to us. If you look at, the, if we contemplate this image um, or any other image, mandala image like this, we start feeling very calm in ourselves and we start feeling very integrated and connected with nature. So what I'm suggesting, what I do myself and what will will encourage people to do on the course is to meditate on these four aspects of Gaia, but in this more mandala-like way so that we can begin to understand some of the great cycles in nature that regulate our climate and have regulated the climate over thousands of millions of years, keeping the temperature and the climate within the narrow limits that life can tolerate over thousands of millions of years. This is one of the dynamics that we'll explore on the course involving CO2 emission from volcanoes and marine algae and vegetation on the land. We won't go into it now. It's just a little taster to tempt you to come and join the course where we can do this in more detail. This is an ancient uh, Western alchemical image of how these sorts of feedbacks work. You see, can you see the CO2 going round and round and round? It's a bit like this snake biting its tail. It's a very deep image, that. Lovely image. So the snake is biting its tail, but it's also recreating itself at the same time. By, by recycling itself, it's recreating itself. You know, so this is what Gaia does. This is a very Gaian image. And in, in Taoism, we have some tremendous wisdom that can help us here from your own traditional culture. Um, you see, look at this. I love the Tao Te Ching, by the way. I, I'm studying the Tao Te Ching. Returning is the movement of the Tao. Returning is the movement of the Tao. So th this is the Tao. And this is the Tao. The cycling of carbon in and out of the atmosphere, out of the atmosphere into marine algae, down below the earth, into rocks where they're melted and returned through volcanoes. This is the Tao. Returning is the movement of the Tao. So here we have the same four aspects of Gaia, atmosphere, life, rocks and water, in our effort to be have a mytho-scientific Gaia. And here's here are the eight hexagrams of the I Ching from your own culture. I'm, I love the I Ching. I have tremendous respect for the I Ching. Um, and C.G. Jung also, of course, did, did so. And here, you see, we can have the eight, um, the eight hexagrams, earth, rocks, atmosphere, air, water, and uh, wind, I think, is life. And you can see how we can begin to contemplate now these, these eight hexagrams in relation to the four aspects of scientific Gaia. We can unify those with the, the eight hexagrams, sorry, the eight trigrams, I beg your pardon, not hexagrams, the eight trigrams from the I Ching, from your own ancient culture. We can contemplate the earth, the mountains, the water, the wind, the thunder, both as symbolic entities, but also as the real physical entities, real water, real mountain, real earth, real thunder real wind etc um sorry i said that uh, life was wind i can't see because there's a block here it's fire life is fire you see so this is uh, what i suggest as a form of meditation which we can do on the course um and finally more or less i think here we are you can read this for yourself um when you live in a simple sort of way then you can be trusted to care for all things Taoism again, love the world as yourself, and then you can truly care for all things. Okay, thank you. I think that's all I, I want to say. I hope I'm, I think I've kept to time. Okay. Right. So over to over to you now with questions, or any anything you'd like to discuss. Yes, so please, everyone, type your questions, uh, questions or comments, uh, reflections uh, in the chat. Um, yeah. And whilst people are, um, will uh, write their question, um, I have a, a question maybe to, yeah. to start. Um, you begun by um, uh, inviting people to read the IPCC report and speaking a little bit about the data 
and how we yeah. are at a, a crossroads perhaps um mm. and how do you i mean given the alarming data and you being a scientist so uh imagine this data is something that has 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 weight and significance for you how mm. do you where do you turn for hope where do you turn to for hope <laughs> that's a good question um i take a very long view um i think of the entire cosmos you know i think the entire cosmos as i as i mentioned has an intelligence a soul and a purpose and its purpose is self-realization to realize itself in in a way that's very mysterious that we can't understand just like we want to realize ourselves don't we we want to use our talents to the maximum and help others as best we can and realize become as happy as we can it's the same with the universe and of course we can't understand we can't understand what the universe's self-realization is but because the universe is so vast um there may be planets like ours with intelligent life in various parts of the universe and i think this intelligent life like ours is very important for the universe's self-realization but you know it's all very experimental and there will be failures here and there so if our planet turns out to be a kind of failure because of modernity the universe would have learned something from that and there may be other planets somewhere else in the universe where intelligent life like ours and Gaian biospheres like ours succeed and those particular planets reach the highest level of self-realization which we can't even imagine in our case so that's what gives me hope hope it's a long view uh, both in time and space that gives me hope because I, i have to admit that things on our planet don't look particularly promising at the moment instead of the international community coming together to focus on solving the problem of climate change before it's too late instead we're fighting each other and having conflicts with each other and that's not going to help us in any way whatsoever thank you stefan so related to that i think we have a question from karen just to say there is a number here so i don't know uh, who shared the comment about the course and we will uh, have a qr code at the end um, of this session that you can scan and go directly to the link but we'll also mention some more about the the course um towards the end so just then to follow up in the reflections we have mm -hmm. a question from karen that is i think connected to what you were saying how there seems to be this uh i don't know if inertia or uh, lack of response given the the level of the the challenge and she's yeah. asking um how like she's saying that she works Uh, in corporations trying to convince management to make necessary changes uh, but more often than not um, she says we don't manage uh, what would be your suggestion to, to to she says to operationalize i think to bring to practice your yeah. thoughts so that we can change habits and ways of working uh, that's a great question thank you karen yeah i i think it's it's not it doesn't really work just to talk to people in boardrooms you know and to have slide presentations like this one maybe i think what we need to do is get people out in nature and that's what we're going to do on the course we're we're going to ask our participants to spend time in nature with plants with particularly to find their own gaia place in nature and to spend time with nature uh, com connecting with nature speaking with nature speaking with gaia if you like so i think what we need is a personal experience of the animate quality of the earth of the living quality of nature of the soul of nature and you can only discover that by spending time in nature um the, the other thing we're going to do on the course which i would recommend is what i call the deep time walk and we have an app so you can do this on your own you can download deep time walk for free if you look up if you google deep time walk you'll find it for free and it goes on your smartphone and it takes you on a walk over 4.6 kilometers representing 4600 million years which is the age of the earth it takes you through the story of the evolution of the earth so you could take your you could take your 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 people karen you know your executives on a deep time walk you could do it yourself first and learn how to do it 
on the Deep Time Walk website, there, there are trainings that you can do to teach you how to do the, lead the Deep Time Walk. And you can take your executives on a Deep Time Walk and get them to actually bodily experience um, the living qualities of our planet through the science. So that, in short, the answer is take people out into nature, help them to get them to discover their own Gaia place where they can sit quietly in nature and feel the living qualities of nature. Um, that's that's basically how what I would recommend. Yeah. I am also seeing here a question that so one just to say that um, Natalie has shared also the link to the course. If people also want to have a look and then also bring more questions they may have related to the course. And uh, there is a question from a participant that is uh, saying we've been in a deep shift uh, for a while or oh, not a deep shift, deep shit, maybe. So I'm not sure oh. if it's shit or shift. <laughs> okay. Uh, as a deep ecologist, how has your understanding of the challenges and of the uh, of activism, how it has changed since or during COVID? I think it may have it may be shift that was referred shift. to. It. Yeah, we've been in it, shift during for a COVID. While. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How, how has your understanding of the challenges and activism? How has it changed since the COVID era? Uh, for me personally, or just generally. Or both. I would both. imagine it's how you view it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, COVID for me um, and for my fellow Gaian scientists, it was a classic Gaian feedback. You know, a species like us becomes too destructive and too numerous for the planet's health, for the well being of the planet. And so, of course, there's a self regulatory response or feedback from Gaia. Um, and that is the virus, it's classic. I mean, you, you know, even it's an even mainstream view. You don't have to believe the Earth has a soul or anything for that. It's just classic. We we're it's so interconnected globally now that a, a virus that arises in one part of the world can spread very quickly all over the planet. So that that's how I see COVID. It's a warning. It's a shot across our bows. You know, in many ways we were we were kind of lucky with COVID that it wasn't. Um, it's so dangerous that we couldn't develop vaccines against it. And so it's a warning shot. Of course, COVID is here to stay and it's still killing a lot of people. Um, so it's a, I see it as a message from Gaia telling us, hey, modern modernity, stop this crazy idea of yours of endless economic growth. Instead of endless economic growth, which depends on burning more fossil fuels, extracting more resources from my forests and from my rocks and from my oceans, just turn the growth inward, make the growth be an inner growth, a growth of your understanding of your spirituality and of your connection with me, Gaia. That's the kind of growth you can have. I call that intelligent growth. Endless economic growth, material growth, I would call suicidal growth. And I think that's what the COVID pandemic was an invitation for us to understand. But of course, we haven't. <laughs> We're still carrying on with suicidal growth as if as if uh, the, the planet's infinite, you know, and can we can just carry on as we like without stopping. Yeah. Thank you, Stefan. And we have a question also from Sandra. Um, she's asking, is humankind part of Gaia? If so, how does our actions, how do our actions, both positive and negative, tie into the self-regulation of the universe yeah we are completely part of gaia we are gaians i mean you know we know that uh from the science this is where science is so wonderful you know and we share the same genetic code with all living beings even the most early bacteria we all have the same genetic code we all come from the same ancestor ancestral single-celled organisms about three thousand eight hundred million years ago maybe even four thousand million years ago so we're definitely deeply part of Gaia. So tell me the second part of the question. So are we part of Gaia? Yes, basically. And, and, and then, okay, then given that it's a yes, how do our actions, both positive oh. actions and negative oh, yeah. actions, are tied right. into the self-regulation of the universe? Well, you can see that um, 
Everything we do has an impact on our planet. We develop an industrial revolution and we burn fossil fuels and destroy biodiversity and we get the climate crisis. Yeah? And therefore Gaia will, Gaia and feedbacks will be set in train to limit our numbers. I mean, climate change is going to be so severe, according to the IPCC, thousands of scientists in the IPCC, that it's probably going to wipe out modernity. You know, there won't be the kind of situ civilization, so-called, that we have now with airplanes and trains and electricity everywhere. It's probably all going to get severely curtailed. That's a classic guy and feedback as well, you see. So what we have to do is recognize that we live inside a living planet, that we are members of a gigantic planetary community, which is based of all plants, animals, rocks, atmosphere, and water. And we have to live within the limits that that planet gives us. Um, and that's, so we have to do what Lovelock would call sustainable retreat. I rather like that idea. We have to, re we have to get our hands off the planet and let the planet do her own regulation for herself and for all of us, which means a degrowth. Um, it means, for example, I get more practical, the oil companies, they shouldn't be privately owned anymore. They should be owned by the state so that the state can regulate their activities and, and move them towards uh, renewable energy, for example. So we have to degrow, move away from this endless economic growth. We can do it. We have all the technology. The IPCC reports, we have all the technology we need to start living within the limits that Gaia has set for us. But we haven't got the will. We haven't got the will. We're more conscious of what Trump is doing rather than what the climate is doing. You know, um, We're totally distracted by all sorts of things that modernity throws at us. And we, 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 we can't accept that we're in a very dangerous situation. I hope I answered that question. But basically, we're Gaians. And just to end, I think we're, we're very important for Gaia's self-realization, this consciousness of ours. It's very important for Gaia that she has this kind of human consciousness with, with our science as well. Okay, sorry, another question. So just to say if people want to, if for some reason they feel um, they have further questions or they uh, are not convinced by your answer or the person who asked the question, you, you can raise your hand and after your question has been selected in, and you can, yeah, uh, add your comment if you want, put your, unmute yourself and add your comment. We welcome that. Yeah. And, and then we have, um, we have a question from, from Simon and she's, she's asking, so if we, and I think it's a bit connected to what you were just saying, that we have the technology, we have all the technology we need to solve the, the problem. So she's saying, um, if we, we could still regard the planet, I mean, I don't think she's saying that, but I think it's a question. We could still regard, in theory, we could still regard the, the, the planet as a machine to prevent the climate problem. For example, we can control CO2 emission. Uh, we can yeah. uh, make create a new invention to slow down climate change. We can like fixing a machine to keep the temperature mm -hmm. under uh, mm -hmm. 1.5. Why is it important, in your view, to regard the Earth as a living being in order to save the Earth? Mm -hmm. uh, what will be the significant difference if we see the Earth differently? <laughs> That's a wonderful question. Um, well, you're right. We can see the, the Earth as a machine and it would help us. It does help us to some extent to see the Earth mechanistically to a certain extent. Um, but you know, the machine view is rather limited. Um, we can't really think of our own bodies as machines anymore. And we know that in medicine. It doesn't really work that well. Although the machine view is kind of useful, I agree. But the problem is we don't have much respect for machines, do we? I mean, for example, uh, when I was in India, I remember a car broke down. We were, my wife and I were in, driving in a car and it broke down. And the driver just started sort of kicking the car, you know, as if that would help it to work. That's, that, that's the sort of attitude we have towards machines. We sort of push them and kick them and punch them and, you know, rattle them. And we treat them with tremendous dis disrespect. That's not going to help us. Um, we need to feel the earth as, as a living organism, as a great personality, as a great person, 
then you see we can approach we can sorry we can use our mechanistic view um, with tremendous respect as if we're we're helping with our, our helping our grandmother to feel better you know do you feel your grandmother is a machine not really and your earth is your great 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 Gaia is your great great grandmother she's our mother we, we we were born out of her and we'll die back into her she's not a machine she's a she's a great grandmother put it like that and if we treat her with respect in that way yes we can use the mechanistic view to understand to some extent how we can control climate change to some extent yes the mechanistic view is, is a useful tool uh, as long as we use it carefully but if we use it um, as we could say as an ontological foundation is that's to say as if we we think the earth really is a machine then we're not going to have the right respectful attitude um, for developing a, a good relationship with her mm -hmm. I was, yes. I was also then reflecting this myself. I don't know if uh, Simon wants to comment. Um, I was reflecting that uh, also there's solutions, but like you were saying, it does seem mm -hmm. like the solutions, they are not enough because it does come to a point where it hits our own comfort, how we live our lives, accumulation yeah. of power, of money. And only by really caring for something we may give up some of those things um, yes well that's right but it's also a matter of survival you know if if i realize that if i consume too much it's going to affect my comfort and in the end i won't have very much left to consume i'm going to consume less if i can understand that so there's different levels of understanding one is mechanistic the most superficial is mechanistic selfish level which helps up to a certain point to change the situation but we need something much deeper to have real deep change which is that we have to see the earth as a living being in fact my friend david abram you know he says we have two bodies one is this body little human body and it lives inside this far vaster second body which is gaia which is the earth the earth is literally our wider body and we live inside the earth just like microbes live inside our guts so we are sort of endosymbiotic to Gaia. If we have that view, of course, it's crazy to harm our wider body. Then the forests are kind of our organs of our bodies. The oceans are our organs. Everything in the, in the world is an organ of our, of our own human wider body, which is Gaia. I just saw a question from Brent, which I thought was interesting, um, talking about paradigm shifts and Kuhnian paradigm shift, and he says, do we have to wait for the old guard to die off? Yeah, I think we do, but we haven't got time for that. You know, um, we haven't got time. We've got to, we've, the old, moder old mechanistic worldview of modernity has to die off pretty fast. But the alternative is even more beautiful that we live inside a living planet, like I was just saying. That's the new paradigm. Gaia is the new paradigm. Gaia, like Mary Midgley, the British philosopher, uh, I agree. She said that Gaia is is the worldview for the 21st century. She has to be right about that. Yeah, go on. Any more questions? Um, Brent also has another question where he was asking, given this is a planetary problem, how can we mm. co cultivate awareness, not just in a small group of individuals, but in a collective, like to reach a critical mass, to undo, yeah. undo what we've done? Yes. Well, you have to start with yourself, I think, Brent, don't we? we have to start with ourselves. What else have we got? I've only got, I've only got myself. So the first thing to do is to cultivate Gaia and awareness connection with Gaia for myself. And I do that by, as a scientist, by studying the science. But more deeply than that, trying to link the science with, I would say, with the mythological dimension of Gaia, as I was explaining. In Chinese culture, you have the Tao, which is the most wonderful understanding of Gaia. Um, so, and then we can join with others and influence others, and together we can do, we can carry out major changes. But it has to start with the individual, and then the individual can. This is what we're going to look at in deep ecology when on the course we're going to look at how deep experiences of connection with Gaia can translate into actions, our own actions in the world, big or small. 
So that's where I think your your question leads us into deep ecologies. We we haven't got time to explore now. We will do it on the course. Speaking of a critical mass, um, Holly, let me just see. Just lost it, but she was asking if you've ever done um, a TED talk. Um, oh, <laughs> I was invited to do a a TED talk in Vancouver um, on the deep time walk in a really big TED meeting. But I didn't want to travel that far um, because of the carbon emissions. I didn't, and I, also for other reasons. So I'm still waiting for them to ask me to do something with them. Uh, so I will. I, it looks like I will be doing something with Ted at some point. Yes. Yeah, so it's actually not from Holly, but from a participant, and send the question through her. And the participant says, "Your message on Gaia philosophy needs to find a broader audience in order to become a larger movement." Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's why we're holding this course and why we're doing this talk. I mean, what else can I do? I can only, this is all I can do. You know, I can just share these ideas and these these thoughts and suggestions with you. Um, I'm not interested in starting a movement because I think the problem with the movement is it sounds like there's a set of principles everyone has to sign up to and that, that you can lose your individuality in a movement. If there is a movement, it's a movement of individuals, people who are really themselves in, in, in the body of Gaia. Um, movement almost pales into sort of, uh, you know, uh, an organization or something like that, which I, I feel very uncomfortable about. But yes, this is what this is what we're doing. We're all here together on this Zoom call. We're sharing our ideas and our insights. We're trying to generate some pro Gaian energy. So we're doing it now. This is what we're doing it. So connected to that, also Adrian um, uh, said, thanks, Stefan, and is asking after the course, after joining the course, how will mm. we be able to contribute to avert the changes done in the last 60 years, like follow up campaigns, uh, he's mentioning. He, she, well, that, that's a good question. Thank you. Well, I think you have to look at what you can do in your own life. Um, it might be big, it might be small. Um, it might just be helping your neighbor with a bit of gardening or growing some vegetables for your neighbor or starting a, a city garden, whatever it is, or it might be big, it might be convincing the local municipality to protect nature or reduce their carbon emissions, whatever, whatever you have to do, whatever you do, you have to do it very peacefully, though, it has to be very peaceful, very Taoist, uh, very Taoist attitude is required to bring about these changes very peaceful, very non-confrontational, speaking, talking, convincing through friendship. I think that's that's the way to do it. But you, what you do if you are in your own life, you have to look at your own life and see what you can do, what, what you're capable of doing given your health and your age um, and your possibilities. So it's a very individual path, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I think back to a question that in a way comes back to some of the things we were talking about uh, during engineering and technology to solve the, oh, the crisis. Yes. Yeah. So Joe is asking, Joe Lem, with a yeah. deeper understanding of Gaia, could we help her heal faster uh, through gene engineering, synthetic biology, etc.? Yeah, geo, I'm very, very concerned about geoengineering or certain kinds of geoengineering. I mean, the one that concerns me the most in geoengineering is the idea of putting particles of some sort into the atmosphere to reflect solar energy back to space. And the latest manifestation of this idea, which you may have heard of, is to take dust from the moon, moon dust, literally from the moon, and and spray it in front of the sun so that it blocks sunlight uh, coming down to the earth. Now that, or, or the other way you can do that is by, um, closer to the earth, is by putting lots of sulfate emissions into the atmosphere from, the, from airplanes, you know, to make more clouds. The, these things are really dangerous. One, because it'll change the climate patterns on the earth in ways that we can't predict. Even with our scientific models of the climate, we can't really predict what'll happen. So some places will have more rain, other places will have more drought. And, and secondly, if we do these kinds of geoengineering, which reflect solar energy back to space, 
it means people on the earth will think oh great now we can emit as much carbon as we want because we're reflecting energy back to space and that's extremely dangerous because the carbon emissions will build up and build up and build up and if for some reason in the future we have to we stop the geoengineering we stop reflecting sunlight to space the warming that will happen will be so sudden and so catastrophic it'll definitely wipe out um, the entire culture so other kinds of geoengineering maybe if we could find ways of extracting carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and carbon from the atmosphere and burying it underground that might help problem is that hasn't been proven that technology hasn't been proven carbon capture and storage it's called ccs hasn't been proven the british government is pretending that it can do that but it you know it probably can't and even if you can um then the argument would be oh, okay oh, look we can now emit burn more fossil fuels because we're going to capture the carbon and bury it underground but that technology is completely unproven we haven't got time to see whether that technology can work so for all those reasons i'm very much against geo geoengineering the best geoengineering if we want to have geoengineering is to stop destroying nature and to rewild vast areas of nature and those rewilded areas will begin to absorb carbon from the atmosphere on a big scale that means we have to stop farming for meat we have to have different ways of growing our food um, and it has tremendous implications for how we use land but rewilding is the best geoengineering that's viable i think um i'm not sure if you want also to comment on syn syn synthetic biology oh, synthetic, synthetic biology oh yeah thank you well um i don't like it in principle but imagine that you could create um say species of bacteria that would produce meat protein or proteins in meat so that we wouldn't have to farm animals for meat then i would sort of tentatively agree with that given the seriousness of the situation Another possibility which, which my colleague George Monbio is promoting is that we could ferment um, we could ferment bacteria in special vats to produce proteins that we can eat. And that would require very little land use and very little energy compared to what we're using now. That I'm kind of in favor of that alongside farming for vegetable growing. I'm in favor of that. I, I agree with him. We can't keep using land for growing cattle and for farming animals on a big scale. So that kind of synthetic biology, given the absolute seriousness of our situation, you know, the absolute precipice that we're facing because of the detrimental use um, of land by livestock farming, I, I think I would agree with that. I'd be very happy to eat synthetically fermented pr meat protein. I'm very happy. In fact, I wish I could do it. Um, so that there, there, I'm I'm more in agreement, but not with geoengineering. Uh, thank you, Stefan. And then going back to so a question from uh, Danny uh, that connects back to a question we had earlier on, I think, from Karen, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah. um, that it was around how do we change bring change in corporations. Um, yes. And now Dan is asking, following up on that, to say, how can we persuade somebody who obviously cares more about profit than the environment to go to nature, to observe Gaia and take action? Are there any successful examples? Well, so just to, can you just summarize the question? How can we get people to yeah. change their so, minds who, who are involved with big business and with with yeah government. imagine someone who cares more about profit who yeah, first yeah. Will think of profit how do you how do you <sighs> persuade maybe through your ears yeah. also at schumacher maybe if you've seen people who are really um in corporates big executives who, yes. who yes. have taken different courses yes. in their life um yes i have i mean i'll tell you an example but sometimes you just can't get through to a person it's just impossible so the best thing to do is assess whether you can get through to this person or not if you can't just leave it and find someone in the corporate sector or in the government to through whom you can get to you see it's not a question of thinking it's a question of feeling it's a question of heart connection 
I remember one time at Shimaha College, you know, we had an opening circle for one course long, long ago. And everyone goes around exp saying who they are, you know, where they come from. And we had one guy from Africa who said, oh, I'm from the Ogoni tribe in Nigeria. And Shell has been destroying our, our environment. They've, oil leaks everywhere. They don't care about oil spills because the Nigerian government doesn't regulate them. And it's impossible to regulate. So they're, they're destroying everything. And next to him, right next to him, was a European guy. And when it came to his time to speak, he sort of got really silent, you know. It took him a long time to say anything. And then he said, I work for Shell. I work for Shell. And I work in public relations for Shell, you know. And he was deeply shocked by what he'd heard from the African guy next door to him. And they became very good friends. And after that, um, Pepik, the European guy who's from Holland, he, he, he resigned from Shell and he set up his own business consultancy, green business consultancy called Innovadas. His name is Pepik Henneman. And he came and did the MSc in holistic science after that. And now he's been working in Holland for many, many years in pro guyan ways with businesses. Pepik Henneman, Innovadas. That's a classic story, you see. So Pepik was ready to change. Some people aren't. Some people are. So you have to find those people in the business world and in the government who are willing to change. And there are more and more of them now. More and more people are sort of waking up to Gaia. But not enough yet, of course. So if you're able to reach people like that, please do, you know, but choose them carefully. Building uh -huh. on that, but moving to the public sector, <laughs> we have a yeah. question from Bowie to say, um, combating, combating climate change is also highly dependent on politic will. Do you also have a view uh, on this? In what way Gaia, uh, Gaia thinking can also play a role to influence a state system? Yeah, well, it's basically what I said before. I think politicians, leaders, you know, they have to... They have to realize from the science that we don't live on an, on an infinite planet with infinite resources. The resources are limited and we've, we've already gone way beyond the limits. We know that from the science of the planetary boundaries. There's a very important concept called planetary boundaries, which we'll explore on the course in more detail. So you can show politicians the data. And as long as they're intelligent, and many of them are, they'll realize, well, we can't keep going with this this model. Um, it's destroying the whole planet. It's destroying us. The other problem with politicians at the moment is, is that they, you know, we're having a lot of problems now with politicians fighting each other. Um, there's a danger of, we've got the war in Ukraine. It's incredibly dangerous. We haven't got time to have wars anymore. We've got to, we've got to collaborate with each other. And for that, you need politicians who can understand the dangers of climate change. But many of them don't, unfortunately. But again, if you're working with politicians, find the ones who can understand the, these, this, these ideas and these dangers based on the science and work with them somehow. We need political leaders who are pro guyans And at the moment, apart from Biden in America, I, uh, I can't think of anyone, any political leaders who are really, really understand or really acting on, on, on the grave danger that the whole planet is facing. I know in China, uh, a great deal of progress has been made with renewable technologies, etc. And that's tremendously helpful for the whole planet. But we need that needs to be scaled up much, much more than now. Now on mm -hmm. spreading the, the message and how to frame this message to people, we have a comment from Ying saying, um, uh, I so I'm quoting uh, her. Mm. I personally think that myth, myths, mythoscientifical, I think was the word that you that you used in yeah. the presentation, is a yeah. word inviting critics in a way, since modern, uh, inviting a criticism in a way, since modern people don't find themselves related to myth. No. Well, that's the problem. So how can I answer that question? Imagine I've got a personal psychological problem which is causing me a lot of suffering. Um, I've got two choices. Either I can go to someone who can help me understand my problem, 
and it might be quite painful to work through it. But if I do that, I'll be free of that problem. If not, I'm going to be stuck in that problem for the rest of my life and I'll be miserable. So our problem, I think, is that we have lost connection with myth, with, with the mythical dimension, with meaning, with sentience, with the, the animacy of the cosmos, with the livingness of the cosmos, the sentience in matter, in nature, with meaning. Myth covers all of those things, you could say. And I don't think we should be ashamed of saying that. I would invite the critics. We can, we can show the critics what lack of myth has done to ourselves and to the planet. It's, it's the planet, it's created the planetary crisis. So let's have the critics and let's talk to the critics. We need to talk to the critics. We need to face up to their criticisms because ultimately their criticisms are totally invalid. You know, we've got to find meaning and connection with nature. Otherwise, our modernity hasn't got a hope of surviving. Nature will wipe us out. Hmm. Yeah, Dan, Dan was saying analytical psychology and archetypal astrology are helping. Yeah, well, on the course, we'll look at the work of C.G. Jung, the great Swiss psychologist who really talked about this kind of thing, about how myth and meaning are, are what we're missing in modernity and how we need to rediscover them. So that'll be part of the course that we're going to be doing. <clears throat> Okay, so we have now a question uh, asking on a new kind of area that is with um, children. Um, how do, we co do you communicate this to children? Let me just find the question again. Yes, from Olivia. So re oh. regarding teenagers and children, how can we communicate uh, Gaia with them if the situation <laughs> is a lecture or a talk? Oh, well, children are naturally Gaians, you know. I mean, just think, of, I, I don't know how it is in Hong Kong, but if you take children up to the Kaduri farm and you'll see them running around in the jungle and loving seeing birds and cats and animals. All human beings are naturally Gaians. We're all naturally connected to Gaia. It's our birthright, you know. And so what we need to do with children is keep that going. Whereas, at least in the British educational system, that is sort of beaten out of you certainly by the time you get to about 10 years old now okay enough of that connecting with rabbits and the forest now you've got to get down and become a good cog in in the machine of uh, you know the economic global machine and it's beaten out of you and by the time you get to teenager at least in britain i mean it's very very sad you know to see british teenagers very disconnected and there's lots of problems with drug abuse and alcoholism and depression and even suicide and all of that is because of a loss of connection with gaia loss of connection with with uh, community human community and natural community so we've got to keep those connections open for children and then through into adolescence and then into adulthood just like traditional cultures used to do We've, we moderns have got to find a way of doing that, given what we've done to ourselves and to the planet. It's not an easy task, but somehow we have to do it. Giving talks to children, yeah, it's much better to take children out to a pond with some nets. I remember when I was about 10 with my school in London, we went to a pond on Hampstead Heath and we were collecting dragonfly larvae and little frogs. And that made a big impression on me, I tell you. I was already a young ecologist, but I'll never forget that. So children remember experiences like that. And in Hong Kong, you've got Kuduri Farm, you see. It's a wonderful piece of forest from what I understand. I haven't been there, that's what I understand. You can, if you're a teacher, take the children to Kuduri Farm as soon as you can. Uh, um, and uh, also teenagers. For teenagers, you can have vision quests. You know, you can get them to spend the night alone in the forest with a, a nice tent and a bit of water and food and just let them spend the night in the forest. And that often produces a tremendous sense of awakening and connection for teenagers. And the same with grown-ups. Mm -hmm. um, I think, so we will have this question. We may, ha may have time for one more. And uh, this one is from yeah. Kelly. And she, well, she's thanking you for sharing. And then she's saying, she's curious <laughs> about your daily practice to embrace Gaia. Um, mm -hmm. And also, if you have ever encountered difficulties in doing it, 
um, oh, in, yeah. in promoting, in, sorry, in protecting, promoting the world to protect Gaia. So one is your daily practice to embrace Gaia, and the other yeah. is if you ever encounter difficulties in doing it, and if you do, how do you solve it? So it's really she's wanting to hear your experience, personal experience. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've had difficulties because I've been trained as a scientist, and I'm also part of modernity, and modernity is anti-Gaia, I would say. So it's it's swimming against the current to connect yourself with Gaia. But what I do is I have a Gaia place or several Gaia places in my garden, very close to my home. And I go there every day and I spend time there, sometimes five minutes, sometimes two hours, sometimes three hours. I just spend time there. And I, sometimes I feel a sense of connection straight away. Sometimes not. Sometimes I feel these obstacles in myself which come from modernity and my scientific education, such as a voice will say, oh, what are you doing just sitting here trying to communicate with Gaia? There is no Gaia, it's just a dead machine. You know, I have that voice, you know, from my scientific background and from the whole culture. Uh, and then I just sit there and I, I do certain bre breathing, is, I find very helpful. You know, there's a sort of breathing where you breathe four in, hold for seven and breathe out for eight. You see, even just doing that makes me feel very calm. And you feel very calm. And I find when I do that, that voice tends to diminish. And then maybe a bird will, I hear a bird song or I hear the rain on the leaves and suddenly the whole of nature starts to speak to me again. And that voice that was trying to stop me from connecting with Gaia now says to me, oh, of course, yes, of course. Yes, I can feel Gaia now. And the scientist in me says, oh, Yes, we have complexity theory. We have a whole new way of thinking in science. We have quantum physics, we have ecology, we have Gaia and science, we have complexity theory. Our thinking is now advanced enough in science that it's consistent with the feeling, with my sensing, with my intuition. And then I have what I would call the experience of being gaia And this is very difficult to describe, you know can't describe it is then the Taoism the Tao, the Tao that can be spoken is not the Tao or Wittgenstein whereof we cannot speak we must be silent we sort of enter into that realm and you can't say anything more about it all I can say is that it's a really deep unshakable knowing that the earth and the cosmos are huge living in sacred intelligences that have a purpose, a deep purpose, which is good, and that we are part of that. Humanity is part of that and essentially uh, really necessary for that self-realization of the wider whole. That's all I can say. Thank you, Stefan. And we have, I'll bring together the two last questions. And just to say also, there's been messages that we will follow to Stefan later. Um, but messages relating to the Tao Te Ching, so not questions, but uh, people sharing related to Tao Te Ching, relating to vegetarian, speaking of vegetarian uh, food, vegetarian diet, messages appreciating the talk, and we'll get those messages to Stefan later. Thank and you. we have uh, then combining the two last questions, and then we really need to move to a close. Um, yeah. so one referring back to what you were sharing about uh, children and education. So there's a question mm -hmm. from Yoke Nam saying, thank you for sharing. In this case, I guess we are looking at the idea of biophilia in education. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. th this is one question. And then um, the, the last one is, I think we, you, you spoke a little bit already about this, but the, it's bringing back the notion that we need to, that won't be enough um, for personal individual experience to save the earth for individual change that we may actually need a movement to happen. So those two questions to... Okay, end. yeah, thank you. Biophilia was coined by the great um, American bioecologist E.O. Wilson, who I have tremendous respect, respect for. So I would call it Gaiaphilia. Because biophilia just re refers to the biology, which is very important, but it's, it's got to be more than biology, it's got to be Gaia, Gaiaphilia. Um, love of Gaia, with all her plants, animals, microbes, fungi, protoctista, atmosphere, water and rocks. We need to cultivate our Gaian 
Gaiophilia. We need to become, we need to uncover our Gaian ness. Everyone, every sing, single human being is a Gaian. But that Gaian ness, that Gaiophilia is covered over by sediments of cultural conditioning from modernity, as I said before, which tells us that the our lives are meaningless, that the earth is meaningless, that there's no, the universe is just a dead mechanism, all of that. We have to break through so our Gaia filia ness can come to the fore and rescue us from that. About a movement, right, the ne next bit. Well, as I said before, um, I, I'm a bit nervous. Uh, okay, we, we can talk about the deep ecology movement, Arnie Ness, who we'll encounter in the course, he talked about the deep ecology movement. It is a movement, but it's a movement of people who are themselves, who are really deeply themselves in their own Gaian way. They're Gaians, individual Gaians. They're not following uh, a particular credo or a particular religion or a, or a particular um, pre-digested set of principles which you have to adopt in order to be a member of the club. You know, No, it has to, like Jung said, it has to be, in its individuality, everyone has to be the Gaian, in, I would say, in their own way. Um, then we can have a movement of free individuals, not a movement of people who all subscribe to the same credo or ideology. That's not going to work. We've seen that in the past. It's never worked. So it's a big challenge. Not only do we have to find our way back to loving the earth, we have to do that in a way that's individual and unique to each person. So it's also a movement of personal growth or personal realization, which involves a reconnection with Gaia, you see? So it's a big challenge. So deep ecology movement, yeah. I mean, Arnie Ness, he never liked the idea of deep ecologist. You know, he never said, please don't say you're a deep ecologist. And we'll explore deep ecology in the course if you come. He said, it's better to say, you are a supporter of the deep ecology movement. You see, that gives you your individuality. You have decided to support the movement as an individual, as your own self. You have to be your own self. You know, in Taoism, it's the same. You know, you have to, there's a saying in the West, to your own self be true. And I think the, the Taoist sages were really themselves, you know. Um, so this question of self-realization is very important. We'll look at that in the course as well. Jungian psychology develops that he called he called it individuation so it's very important you see the whole movement is both a psychological movement an inner movement and also an outer movement to change the way we consume nature so it's difficult it's a tall order to do that but it can be done yeah well i think we've come to the end <laughs> okay. Okay. um and so really want to thank everyone for coming. And I think this is a taste of the course, not just in terms of the content, but also in the opportunity we have to really um, give time to each other's questions and reflections. Um, here, because we were more than 100, we didn't get to, to speak with one another, but during the course, we will have the space for this interaction um, that is not just with Stefan, but be between ourselves. And I, I've learned a lot tonight from the questions you've asked. So also thank you all for participating so, so actively and bringing your presences to this. And yes, the course will be, you can see more. So there's the QR code that uh, is here. You can see on the screen. So there's information. So I'm not going to take your time now sharing information about it. It's really well described, but you can also contact uh, Natalie on the email that is on the website if you want to know more, if there's any question that come. Um, we hope um, you, some of you can come and join us for these uh, two weeks. And there's also uh, our Earth Talks. Uh, I don't know if all of you know, so last it started last year where we have a series of talks with uh, international speakers who are really inspiring us with different um, different topics, but really all of them bringing us to reconcile with um, the experience of being part of nature. That, so our theme for this year is called, it's called We Are Nature, and we have different speakers coming to inspire us. So um, we will have in April on Earth Day, Satish Kumar. Um, you can read more about him on the website if you have not heard about him. He's the founder of Schumacher College in the UK. 
and also from Vandana Shiva, who has her own center in India and has been doing a lot of work with agriculture and on seeds and women and really bringing, bringing the work uh, with the soil really back uh, to our imagination and to our hearts and to our everyday life. So um, we hope you can join us in some of this and maybe you can, cannot join the course, but you can join the, the talk. So have a look and do come so we can continue exploring and being inspired and learning from each other. You will receive a questionnaire between today and tomorrow uh, to give your feedback on the talk. We really hope you can spare some time to answer because it helps us improve our work. And yes, we hope you can also spread the word of these opportunities to other people who you think. So this is part of also creating a movement um, of, a, of, a, of a kind of sharing the word in our network. So this is also a way of uh, making movement and sharing the inspiration. Juliana, someone just asked if they can share the recording of the session today. Yes, so we do share the recording also by email, the link to the recording, and it will also be on the YouTube of Kaduri Farm. So you can also share the recording with uh, other people who may not have had uh, the chance of joining tonight. Thank you very much, everyone. Maybe, Stefan, you can, as people leave the room, we can have uh, some of your guy and music to inspire sure. us. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.